Anyone who's ever tried to lose weight will know that it's damn hard. But why exactly is that? Science has a few answers. How's it going guys? My name's Richie Kerwin and today we're going to talk about the many reasons that losing weight is so hard. From the biological reasons to the even more important reasons that most people don't even think about. Just to start with a little context for this video, the US weight loss industry was worth an estimated $71 billion in 2020. So clearly a lot of people are willing to spend a lot of money to lose some weight. If it was an easy thing to achieve, I don't think it would be that lucrative a business. So what is it that makes losing weight so hard? Let's start with metabolism. Everybody knows, or you're about to find out at least, that your metabolism is made up of a number of different components. You have your basal metabolic rate, or BMR, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT, your exercise activity thermogenesis, and the thermic effect of food, or TEF which is sometimes also called diet-induced thermogenesis. Your BMR is the energy that your body uses to maintain all the essential metabolic processes when you're at rest. In other words, it's the energy that you need just to stay alive. Meat is all the energy you use for activity that isn't specifically exercise, like walking from your car to the office, scratching your head, carrying your groceries, fidgeting in your chair, moving your arms like a crazy person, all that stuff. TEF is the energy that you burn just processing the food that you've eaten. And that varies based on the macronutrients that you consume. And EAT is all the energy you spend when exercising. And all of these components together make up your total daily energy expenditure or TDEE. If you're interested in learning more about all this, a lot of the information in this video came from an excellent review paper from Trexler et al titled Metabolic Adaptation to Weight Loss, Implications for the Athlete. For the moment, we'll just focus on the first two components, BMR and NEAT. Because BMR is the energy we need to keep our body alive, if you have a bigger body, you'll burn more energy. Simple as that. That's the reason why all online calorie calculators ask for your body weight. Muscle, body fat, and all your internal organs use energy. The more of them you have, the more energy you use. On the other hand, when you lose weight, you lose body fat and you often lose muscle and even some internal organs can get a little bit smaller. What all that means is that as you lose weight, your basal metabolic rate drops too. So as an example, if somebody starts a diet at 2000 calories and they're happily losing weight for a few weeks, eventually their weight loss will slow down and eventually stop because they're now a few kilos lighter. They have less body mass and they have a lower BMR. That's a pretty simple explanation. However, in experiments where they monitor people's BMR as they lose weight, Scientists often find that BMR actually drops lower than what they would actually calculate for the amount of weight that they've lost. In other words, not all of the drop in BMR with weight loss can be explained by the loss of body mass. So what's going on? This is where something called metabolic adaptation or adaptive thermogenesis comes into play. You see, when your body realizes you're losing weight and it has a number of ways of doing that, including knowing when your calorie intake is lower than normal or if your body fat or muscle mass decreases, it starts to think you're starving. So if your body thinks you might not have enough food, it starts to do everything it can to reduce energy expenditure. It does this in a number of ways, but in general, it tries to make your metabolism more efficient. Now, whenever someone hears efficient metabolism, they often assume that means it must burn loads of calories, right? Actually, it's quite the opposite. And to help you understand this, try thinking of a car engine. Cars back in the 60s and 70s were famous for being gas guzzlers and having really poor mileage. So you could fill it up with fuel and it wouldn't be long before you needed to refuel again. Why? Because the engines were very inefficient and a lot of the fuel that should have been used for moving the cars was lost as heat or sound or exhaust fumes. Since then, engine design has become a lot more efficient and now we can travel a lot further on the same amount of fuel. The same applies to your body. A more efficient metabolism uses fuel, our food and fat stores, more efficiently and burns less. How exactly does this happen? Well, one pretty well-researched theory is an increased mitochondrial efficiency. Remember mitochondria from biology class? They're the tiny organelles that act as the powerhouse of the cell. Literally every biology book ever made says that. They help convert carbs and fats into energy or specifically into ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency of the cell. They do this by transferring protons across the mitochondrial membrane, a process that is coupled with ATP production. However, 
That process isn't always efficient and sometimes protons leak across the membrane and don't produce ATP. This is called uncoupled respiration. And some experiments show that it actually forms a really big part of energy expenditure under normal conditions. So for example, in rats, it can be up to 20% of basal metabolic rate. However, when we diet and get fewer calories than normal, we see a drop in proton leak or uncoupled respiration. There are possibly a few reasons for this, like a lower production of uncoupling proteins and a drop in hormones like leptin and thyroid hormone, which happens when we don't get enough calories. But wait, there's more. Not only does your metabolism slow down to prevent further weight loss, your body even stops moving to stop you burning too much energy. Remember I mentioned non-exercise activity thermogenesis? All that movement that you do that isn't exercise? Well, when you're dieting, your body tries to reduce that too. That means you move less in your chair or walk less or even smile less. Think of it like this. If I was deep in a calorie deficit right now, I wouldn't be moving as much as I usually do. I'd be pretty damn lifeless. Kind of like this. Here's another interesting piece of info. When people who don't gain weight easily eat a lot of extra calories, they often subconsciously increase their need, which helps them burn off those calories and maintain their weight. So it clearly works both ways, protecting against excess weight loss and weight gain. To make things even more difficult, not only does your body downregulate metabolism and movement when we start losing weight, it also does a number on your appetite. I mentioned leptin earlier. Leptin is a hormone produced by our fat cells. And generally, the more fat you have on your body, the higher your leptin levels are. Leptin is a satiety hormone, meaning it helps to reduce appetite. So when we lose body fat, or even when we eat fewer calories than normal, we produce less leptin and hunger increases. There's also ghrelin, which is another hormone produced in the stomach that has the opposite effect of leptin. It increases hunger. And when we fast, restrict calories, or potentially when we lose muscle mass from dieting, ghrelin increases and makes you want to rob a bakery. And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to all the changes that happen in our body that make it harder for us to lose weight. From a slower or more efficient metabolism to reduced movement and increased hunger, our bodies really do try as hard as they can to prevent weight loss. But why try so hard? For that, we have to think in terms of our evolution. When animals evolved, our food supply wasn't always plentiful, and our ancestors, both human and much further back, would probably have had to deal with food shortages all the time. As food was never guaranteed, our bodies had a lot of pressure to evolve ways to deal with that. Think about it. If you were living on the plains of Africa 200,000 years ago, and there was a famine, who do you think would live longer? Someone who's super active with a super fast metabolism that's burning fat all the time, or someone who slows things down and spares the little body fat that they have, making it last longer. That's why we reduce our metabolism and reduce non-essential movement when our bodies figure out food is in short supply. We're trying to save as much fuel or body fat as possible to make us live longer. On top of that, making us hungry when we lose weight is a good way to make sure that we seek out food and eat as much of it as possible when it's available. We need to be able to build up our fat stores to help us survive the next famine. It's very hard to fight with millions of years of evolution built into our genes telling us to eat more. By the way, some of you may be thinking, is this the famous starvation mode? When you drop calories too much and can't lose weight? Well, yes, but no. The idea of starvation mode is probably based on this science because most stupid ideas about nutrition in the popular media do have a grain of truth to start with. But, and it's a big but, if you're dieting and losing weight, and your weight loss eventually stalls because of all these mechanisms I've just mentioned, you can restart weight loss by just dropping calories again or increasing exercise. It's not a hard ceiling on weight loss like some people try to make you believe. That said, you'll get to a point where dropping calories isn't really realistic or healthy anymore, in which case weight loss may be painfully slow. This is exactly what happens with physique athletes who diet down for a show. Eventually, weight loss is so slow that they're talking of losing minuscule quantities of fat over the last few weeks before a show. And that's not for everybody. But you know what? There's probably another reason that may be even more important for explaining why losing weight is so hard. And it has absolutely nothing to do with you. Think about it. The biology of human beings has been pretty stable for thousands of years but having a lot of excess body fat only started to become a lot more common in the last 50 years or so. So what changed? Our food environment. We now live in a world where we can eat whatever we want, whenever we want it. At least for many people in the developed world. For many, 
scarcity and hunger is not something they ever need to think about. You can order your starter, main course and dessert from three different restaurants and have it delivered to your door without ever having to leave your sofa. Processed foods are everywhere. They're cheap, they're designed to be delicious and because most of the calories come from refined carbohydrates and added fats, they don't fill you up. So you can just keep eating and eating. On top of that, food advertising is everywhere we look. And even if you don't think so, it is affecting your buying decisions and makes you want more food. Maybe not right away, but at some point. And because of that, the amount of calories that people eat has been increasing for decades. We live in what's known as an obesogenic environment, an environment where gaining weight is easy because getting food is easy and we're encouraged to eat more through advertising. Consequently, losing weight is very, very hard. I know this whole video might seem a bit negative, but the whole point is, if you struggled with weight loss in the past, I want you to know that it's not your fault. Our current food environment that focuses on excess and our long-term survival-focused biology combine to make losing weight damn hard. Yes, losing body fat is possible, and knowing this information, focusing on sustainable nutrition and learning how to manage your food environment play a big role in making that happen. That'll be a whole other video sometime. So what do you think? Did that clear things up for you about why losing weight is so hard? As always, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below and remember to like and subscribe to the My Protein YouTube channel for more great evidence-based nutrition information.